First of all, I'd like to wish all the mothers a very happy Mother's Day. And I'd like to start with the story, um, and this man relates it. Seven years into our marriage, my life was a blur. I was working hard at being a good provider for my wife, Barb, and our two young daughters, Sarah and Missy. I had a full-time job as director of a correctional facility. At the same time, I was working toward a doctoral degree in counseling, spending many evenings each week studying at the university library. Most of the time, I felt stretched beyond my limits. As I juggled family, work, studies, and church activities, I prayed for strength and wisdom, longing for the day I could focus full-time on counseling families. Even more important, I wanted to free up more time to be with Barb, Sarah, and Missy, my family, the love of my life. The job and doctoral dissertation filled my schedule completely. I tried to eke out a little time here and there to help Barb, but I was at best only a part-time husband and father. I honestly thought I was doing rather well in my role at that time. Then one day, I was sitting at my favorite chair, studying for the final stages of my doctoral degree when my five-year-old Sarah announced herself in my presence with the question, Daddy, do you want to see my family picture? I felt really stressed and pressed for time with a week's worth of work to squeeze into a weekend. Sarah, Daddy's busy. Come back in a little while, honey. Sarah obediently left me to my work. Ten minutes later, she swept back into the living room. Daddy, let me show you my picture. The heat went up around my collar. Sarah, I said, come back later. This is important. Three minutes later, she stormed into the living room, got three inches from my nose, and barked with all the power a five-year-old could muster. Do you want to see it or don't you? No, I told her emphatically. I do not. With that, she zoomed out of the room and left me alone. And somehow... Being alone at that moment wasn't as satisfying as I thought it would be. I felt like a jerk. So I got up and went to the front door. Sarah, I called. Can you come back inside a minute, please? I'd like to see your picture. She obliged with no recriminations and hopped onto my lap. It was a great picture. She had even given it a title. Across the top, in her best printing, she had inscribed, Our Family Best. Tell me about it, I said. Here is Mommy, a stick figure with long, yellow, curly hair. Here is me standing by Mommy with a smiley face. Here is Katie, our dog. And here is Missy, her little sister, with a stick, was a stick figure lying in the street in front of the house, about three times bigger than anyone else. It was a pretty good insight into how she saw our family. I love your picture, honey, I told her. I'll hang it on the dining room wall, and each night when I come home from work and from class, which was usually around 10 o'clock at night, I'm going to look at it. She took me on my word, beamed from ear to ear, and I went outside to play. I went back to my books, but for some reason I kept reading the same paragraph over and over. Something made me uneasy. Something about Sarah's picture. Something was missing. I went to the front door again. Sarah, I called. Can you come back inside a minute, please? I want to look at your picture again. Sarah crawled back onto my lap. I asked my little girl a question, but I wasn't sure I wanted to hear the answer. Honey, I see Mama and Sarah and Missy, Katie the dog's in the picture, and the sun and the house and squirrels and birdies. But Sarah, where's Daddy? You're at the library, she said. With that simple statement, my little princess stopped time for me. Lifting her gently off my lap, I sent her back to play in the spring sunshine. I slumped back into my chair, dazed. Even as I typed these words, I could feel those sensations all over again. She had nailed me right between the eyes. I wasn't in her family picture because I was in the library studying. I was too busy to be her daddy at home. Although I didn't remember Barb's having expressed those thoughts, she had probably been trying to get through to me for months. All of the cautions I had received from sermons, books, 
and friends to keep a balanced lifestyle, God first, family second, and work third, had not penetrated my career-bent mind. But Sarah's simple pronouncement got my attention big time. I mounted Sarah's drawing on the dining room wall, just as I promised. And through those long, intense weeks preceding the oral defense of my dissertation, I stared at that revealing picture. It happened late every night as I consumed my warmed-over dinners while my family slept. I didn't have the guts to broach the issue with Barb, and she had the incredible insight to let it rest until I was ready to deal with it. I finally finished my degree program. I was Dr. Rosberg. I guess it should have been a big deal for me, but frankly, there wasn't much joy. It felt a little hollow. One night after graduation, Barb and I were lying in bed together, and I found myself working up the nerve to ask her a question. Actually, there were three questions. It was late. It was dark. And as I murmured my first question, I was praying. Barb had already fallen asleep. Barb, are you sleeping? No. Rats, I thought to myself. Now I'm committed. Question number two. Barb, you obviously have seen Sarah's picture taped on the dining room wall. Why haven't you said anything? Because I know how much it has wounded you, Gary. Words from a wise woman, wise beyond her 20-something years. Next, I asked the toughest question I've ever asked anyone in my entire life. Barb, I want to come home. May I come home? 20 seconds of silence followed. It seemed as if I held my breath for an hour. Gary, Barb said, the girls and I love you very much. We want you home. But you haven't been here. We don't know you anymore. The words look cold in print, but she said them with restraint and tenderness. It was just the plain, unvarnished truth. My little girl had drawn the picture, and her mom was speaking the words. I lay there in the dark, pretending to sleep, but I couldn't. Events raced through my mind. I remembered when Missy was two and refused to sit on my lap for more than a few seconds. Why? Because she didn't know her daddy. After Barb's chilling words, I slipped out of bed and went downstairs to our living room. I pleaded with God that night for wisdom, perseverance, and faith. I begged him to restore my family. I was at risk of losing the security, joy, and direction I dreamed of and expected from our marriage. Publicly, I appeared fine to our friends, co-workers, and even extended family, but privately, I could not fool the three people closest to me. I was a man missing in action in our family, and Barb, Sarah, and Missy knew it. Deep down, I knew that God is a God of second chances. He's capable of leaving me through the restoration process with my family. But that night, as I poured out my heart to God in our living room, my hope for the future seemed buried under an avalanche of pain and discouragement in my heart. And what about Barb? Would she offer me a second chance? I'll let her tell her side of the story in her own words. Our marriage had been my dream come true, but during the stressful years, it was hard to stay optimistic. Our marriage wasn't what I expected it to be. Gary was my best friend, and I missed him. Most days, he left home before 7 o'clock in the morning, and many nights he didn't return home until after 10 o'clock. The girls hardly saw their daddy. I loved my husband and was devoted to our marriage. The Lord comforted me, but it was still difficult. I was determined to keep my marriage vows to this man and to God, but I lived day in and day out needing more connection with Gary. I didn't understand at the time that God created me with legitimate needs he intended to meet through my husband. And since Gary was so absorbed outside the home, many of these needs were unmet. I came to the point where I quit talking to Gary about my thoughts and feelings of isolation. It seemed useless. In some ways, I stopped trying. I stopped expecting Gary to fight this enemy of workaholism that was undermining our marriage. I made suggestions, tried new approaches, even pleaded, but nothing ever changed. I didn't know how to stop it. One day, a switch flipped on the inside. I made the decision to give up. I never told Gary or anyone else, but I remember the moment I stood in the middle of our living room on the green shag carpet and made the decision to quit trying. I was protecting my heart from feeling the hurt, so I thought. 
But by building a wall of protection around myself, I was not only locking up my heart, but unfortunately also locking Gary out. On the outside, I continued to be respectful, even pleasant, but on the inside, I knew the difference. There was less transparency and sharing between us and more formality and distance. We were committed to each other, and I never would have consciously thought about walking away from him, but I had emotionally disconnected from my husband. I know now that we were in a very vulnerable position at the time. I know now that if our disconnection had lasted for six months or more, I could have been a statistic, a walk-away wife. But God in his mercy intervened before that could happen. He began to answer my prayers once I got out of the way. Then he began to work in my husband's life. He used our daughter's crayon drawing to break through to Gary. A child's simple picture was the tool. It became a non-threatening voice to help a distracted man get refocused. When Gary asked me that night if he could come home, I had no doubts that he loved me, and my love was so deep and non-negotiable that all I wanted was for him to come home. But would he? Could he really change? His doctorate was something we both wanted and worked for, but our marriage was suffering because of it. We didn't know how to nurture and tend our marriage. It became brittle and demanding. The distance had taken its toll, and we both knew it. I sensed an emotional distance from Gary and me. When we were together, I didn't feel the same closeness and connection we once had. I desperately wanted Gary to come home, but in order for that to happen, something would have to change. My dear the beloved in Christ, marriage can be compared to a delicate plant. In order for it to be healthy, thrive, and flourish, it must be nurtured every day and protected from adverse influences. If it does not receive care, a proper environment and nutrients, it will wither and die. Marriages are fragile and vulnerable, especially in this day and age. 70% of Americans have first-hand knowledge of the tragedy of divorce, leaving children as those most deeply wounded by it. A marriage has a chance only if God's basic plan for it is followed. He must be its anchor and center. Husband and wife, mother and father, need to work daily with God in order to keep their relationship healthy and strong. Otherwise, it will stagnate and decay. God intends that a marriage be a dynamic love relationship between a man and a woman. Each moment brings a couple either closer to each other or farther away. Time, as with many things, can take its toll in a marriage and lead to the natural, prom natural process of damage and decay. To keep anything fresh, alive, and in good order requires care, maintenance, and at times repair. A marriage is not different. The proper hierarchy in a marriage should have God as number one. He must be known, loved, and served foremost. Your spouse must be second and the children third. In far too many homes, couples have all the wrong priorities. Self-gratification and having their own way. Job, career, money, hobby, friends, or addiction to drugs, alcohol, or carnal pleasure, personal entertainment, etc. Couples fail miserably by making such things more important than their relationship with God and family. By neglecting the things that really matter, giving precedence to those which are worldly, couples will find that disastrous results affecting their marriage, family, children, and immortal souls will ensue. Couples must learn to neglect the whole world rather than each other. Sadly, too many finally realize this on their deathbed. Amidst the various temptations and enticements of the world, it's difficult for couples to hold their family's love, the love of spouse and children, as their most prized possession. They're too often blinded by pressures from job, career, temptations of the flesh, and worldly distractions. Only God can keep you focused and must daily be called upon for help. Let's return to our opening story. You're probably wondering how at that point such a situation can change for the better. It would not be easy, but well will worth the effort. The first step would be to establish an amended pattern of life, a frequent examination of conscience and confession. 
This provides a spiritual checkup as to the real state of your soul and the current state of your marriage. The graces of the sacrament of penance will give you strength to detect and overcome the weaknesses, habitual sins, and oversights of the soul. God will show you what to correct, how to avoid sin, and what to keep your ham what to do to keep your family life healthy, thriving, and flourishing. Second, frequent prayer, especially family prayer, is vital. And unfortunately, many times we get so uh, involved in the things of this world that whether it's mass or rosary or other prayers, that takes about 15 minutes for, uh, at mass or at saying these prayers, then we finally start getting some union with God. We have to begin our prayers in union with God and then raise our soul to God and just stay there. No matter how pressing or urgent worldly concerns are, a closer union with God is essential. Even if your life is in shambles, the most important thing you can do is to always make more room for God. Satan will do everything he can to keep you from daily prayer, the rosary, and faithful attendance at Mass. Fixing and deepening your relationship with Almighty God will have a domino effect upon your marriage. A deeper love for each other will present itself. There will be an ensuing, there will ensue a curbing of selfishness and sin and an inflow of abundant graces to keep your marriage and family life on track. Third, you must be willing to be committed to the task of daily growing closer to God and to your spouse. The only person you can change is yourself. Get out of your own way and let God do his work in you. Never give up. That is one of the greatest weapons of the devil. In closing, my dearly beloved in Christ, do not think that you have, if you have hurt your spouse deeply or repeatedly and he or she forgives you, that all will be well. Such wounds are deep. Forgiveness does not completely heal the relationship and make it as if nothing had happened. Scars will be left, and trust and respect must be won all over again, and sometimes with great effort. One person has said that they go by track record. So a new record has to be established. If something has taken years to destroy, then you cannot expect recovery to happen overnight. Wherever you are in your marriage, beginning with babies, teens, or toward the end, you must still work to make it last until death. Just as you would plan for a long journey, so too you need to plan for the long haul of marriage. Each day can be a new start. Do not repeat the mistakes of yesterday, but start fresh with prayer and God will lead the way. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.